Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Piyush Singh, Councillor, Embassy of India, Bern. I welcome all of you to this webinar today. Today, we are meeting amidst the COVID-19 crisis. Every country is devising a strategy for dealing with this situation. The government of India has undertaken a number of reforms for further increasing the ease of doing business in India, and also for further integrating a self-reliant India with the world. Today's webinar is a step in this direction, and it will cover both aspects of this, investment as well as trade in the field of food processing. India and Switzerland have long-standing dynamic partnership. The embassy has been running the MISSP program for further strengthening linkages between the Indian and Swiss business ecosystems. I'm glad to note that in the last six months, we have been able to onboard 50 Swiss companies on this program. Today, our presenters will include the legal and tax partner of MISSP, Dotterlin Partner, the knowledge partner of MISSP, TNA Consulting, and our guest speakers who represent the agricultural and processed food products export development authority of india with those words i would now invite the first speaker of the of the webinar mr tarun gupta to make a presentation on the overview of the indian economy amidst the covid crisis mr gupta the screen is all yours thank you thank you dr singh good afternoon ladies and gentlemen allow me to pull up my presentation just bear with me thank you so first of all, thank you for taking time out to attend this webinar. We live in challenging times. And as one wise man said, every challenge presents an opportunity. Current pandemic will result in new business models, new business partnerships. Can India be a preferred business partner for Switzerland? What are the opportunities in India, the challenges? What has changed in India? What is changing in India? Our aim would be to provide a balanced view and not a Bollywood version. During the pandemic, there's another trend which has picked up is the whole deluge of webinars, death by webinar, use of word new normal. I promise this webinar will be different. The whole presentation can really be summarized in 12 alphabets. So when you think of India, think of four alphabets, four Ds. What are those Ds? Democracy, demography, diversity, and disparity. Democracy, we are proud to be the world's largest democracy. In our last elections, over 900 million people were eligible to vote. 600 million people casted their vote. And the results were out in a couple of hours. It can be chaotic, but I'm proud of democracy. Demography, that's a huge advantage. India is the youngest country in the world. Our median age is 29. Over 70% of our population is within the working age group. We add close to the population of Switzerland every month to our labor pool. We are expected to provide up to generally up to 20% of the global workforce. Next is diversity. India is more diverse as you cross from even Northern Europe to Southern Europe. Diversity in terms of food habits, diversity in terms of languages, we have 22 official languages. And finally, disparity, economic disparity. 1% of country's population has owned 60% of the wealth. 10% own 77% of the wealth. We have the third largest number of billionaires. But it's also not limited to individuals. It's also across the states. There is wide disparity across the states. Up to 10x is the difference. Whereas in other countries, it may be up to 4x. One other differentiating factor from India is the whole sectoral contribution. India is the only country which leapfrogged from agriculture to services. We are proud of that. Our services, uh, with the, including the IT sector, uh, have been the world leader. But what is important is we need to get our manufacturing done. So my first part is when you think of India, think of these four Ds. Moving on. When you think of Indian opportunity, I want you to think of four letters, consumption, formalization, infrastructure, and digitization. I'll come on those. But first, 
what's what is india's investment climate what's our economic vision we want to be a 5 trillion economy it took us 60 years to reach first trillion it took us another seven and a half years to reach a second trillion and now we really are looking to double our gdp in five years is it ambitious very ambitious what does it need it needs us to achieve a real growth rate of eight percent it also needs a virtuous uh, cycle of investment savings and exports how are we doing if you look at our fdi numbers in total over the last 70 years we've got 600 billion dollars of investment out of that half of it has come in only in the last five years 90 percent of that came through automatic routes no approvals required that shows that india is a very open economy now why did we get why have we been so successful that india is ranked as the top three greenfield fdi destination the answer is on this slide the improvement in the ease of doing business there is no other country which has shown such a significant improvement in doing business we are ranked amongst the top 10 improvers for the third consecutive year and now let's give you another uh, acronym all of us have heard of BRICS. now the new terminology is MIVIT: malaysia indonesia vietnam india and thailand these are countries which are competing as some of the world companies look to diversify their supply chain and dependence on the single market so what we have is india stands very very favorably amongst these uh, countries but one big thing which india has which none of the other countries has is a large domestic market that brings me to the first letter of our india opportunity consumption c india is currently ranked as the as the sixth largest consumer market it is expected to become the third largest consumer market in the next 10 years you look at the graph our private consumption is expected to increase four times in the next 10 years but what here i also want to highlight is that there are 10 million households with an annual household income of thirty thousand dollars 25 million households with an annual income between 15 to thirty thousand dollars so really we have 175 million to 200 million people who are the consuming class and this is what is driving there are various numbers of middle class which gets bandied about but really the 200 million people this is not 1.3 but it's not small either that is the consuming class in india so the first letter of india c fit consumption second is formalization let me just step back and give an explanation why this is important india has approximately 75 million enterprises this is eight times this is 22 times the number of enterprises in the us which is about eight times our size but only 10 million have about any tax registration and only 5 million have both tax and social security registration so really we have 60 million who have no registrations and why formalization is important is to improve productivity we have had many firms and we have classified them as dwarfs who who are older than a decade in manufacturing but have less than 100 employees whereas if you look at us uh, a 49 year old manufacturing firm in India will have the same as a five year old firm, whereas in the US it will be eight times the number of employees. Today, 85% of our companies in manufacturing have less than 50 employees. So, really, we want instead of drops, dwarfs, we want babies who grow up, and really it impacts our productivity. Second important factor is we need to improve our tax to GDP ratio. Look at the comparison vis a vis even China, even Brazil our tax to gdp ratio is considerably lower 5% of our population pays income tax now it's important to increase this ratio and third is the formalization is respect for a contract enforcement of contract so first time in india's history we had an insolvency and bankruptcy code where companies were taken into liquidation so summarizing the second is formalization and the third is infrastructure CFID, I stands for infrastructure, and in infrastructure, what we are looking to do, and this figure is important, our annual spend on infrastructure is about $150 billion. But ladies and gentlemen, we are looking to double this. We are looking to double this infrastructure spend 
to about $300 billion annually. And 70% of that will come from the government. And that's why tax to GDP ratio in my earlier slide. Are we doing it? Let me give you a couple of examples. In the road sector, our national highways is about 140,000 kilometers. 30% of that has been built in the last five years. In the next five years, we plan to build in another 60,000 kilometers. So effectively, we would have doubled our whole national highway in 10 years. Today, we are building 30 kilometers of national highway every day. The railways, our total track length is about 68,000 kilometers. We have electrified about 30 or 1,000 kilometers. We plan to achieve 100% electrification in the next five years. We are building dedicated freight corridors. Two of them are in construction. Three more have been announced. So, and finally, if we look at solar power, we have achieved 1,000 times solar capacity in the next 10 years. I can go on. So we have achieved scale and execution in the Indian infrastructure. And the next, the final alphabet is digitization. And what do I mean by digitization? If you look at the India stack, we are unique in this world where India is the only country with over a billion people with their biometrics. And we have not stopped at that. We have built layers on which we are able to provide value-added services. In the last six years, we've opened 380 million new bank accounts. And we have straight away leapfrogged into what is known as to our platform called Unified Payment Interface. This has been a game changer. After 70 years, we have 50 million credit card holders. But today, India's largest mobile wallet company has 150 million active users. In January alone, we crossed 1 billion electronic payments every month. In fact, Google wrote to Federal Reserve saying that a similar model for America. The Bank of International Settlements said that the India's digital financial infrastructure has the potential to transform emerging markets and advanced economies. And the key reason for that is our mobile penetration. We have 600 million people using mobile internet. The, the data usage has jumped fold by 44 times. So India opportunity is four words, consumption, formalization, infrastructure, and digitization. This brings me to the last part of my presentation, which is reforms. Again, four letters to define reforms, four L's. Law, liquidity, labor, and land. We have now a unified taxation system, and we, which has brought about efficiency in logistics. We aim to reduce the cost of logistics from 14% of the GDP to 10% of the GDP. Our transit time for lorries has come down by 25 to 30%. Our size of the warehouses is increasing from 5,000 square meters to 550,000 square meters. So clearly a, a significant jump, which we are doing on the laws. We are repealing old laws. In fact, we have repealed over 1,000 regulations in the last five years to reduce compliance and transparency, wherein the manual intervention is less. And the main purpose is to offer predictability. And you see the cost of compliance on our import documentary credit and how it has come down. Moving on to the second L is, uh, and before I move on that, on the corporate taxation, a quick slide. I know a couple of my colleagues would be covering it, but a quick slide on that is that our corporate taxation rates are globally competitive, including our manufacturing, which is at about 17%. And finally, I just move on to the liquidity part where under a new stimulus, we have offered collateral fee loans and reduced uh, reduced amount of uh, reduced interest rate for bank loans. And finally, we move on to labor reforms. I know my colleagues will talk about, but essentially, we are converting 44 central labor reform laws into four labor codes. And last but not the least, land has traditionally been more expensive. Today, we have competitive federalism where all states are uh, putting it online and have created land parcels. And today. India, and you see in this slide, has 44 industrial clusters and 2 million square meter, 2 million square feet of land ready to, in terms of warehouses uh, for quick possession in the 8 to, uh, eight to 10 weeks period. So I end my presentation with a slide which shows how India has successfully attracted these marquee foreign companies. We would love to see more Swiss companies. And thank you once again for taking time out. Thanks, Tigger, for that presentation. 
Uh, let me now quickly move on to the uh, to the next presentation of this webinar, which is a presentation on the overview and opportunities in the Indian food processing sector. The presentation is being made by Mr. Ashwin Merchant, TA Consulting. Mr. Merchant, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. And good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are. Uh, I don't have more than 12 minutes, so I have to be very fast in what I speak. So if I rush through a few slides, please excuse me, but you can download them later from the MISSP web website. Basically, agriculture plays a very vital role in India's economy. Since more than 56% of the total workforce is employed in this sector or in its allied sectors. Uh, this is not surprising, actually, since India has the largest arable land under cultivation in the world. But there are challenges which remain. When you think of 18% of the world's population living on only 2.4% of the land with access to only 4% of fresh water, that's a challenge. The utilized arable land amounts to about 140 million hectares under agriculture, but 40% of that is dependent on monsoons. Even the land holdings are very small. They average about 1.5 hectare. Yet, India is the largest producer of milk in the world, the second largest producer of fruit and vegetables, as also rice, wheat, and other cereals, and meat. However, India has a big problem with post-production wastage levels. They are high, between 35 to 40 percent, amounting to a loss of about $6 billion every year. The overall processing levels of perishable items is only between 8 to 10 percent. And the biggest bane in all this is the lack of a cold supply chain. For example, uh, let me quote the figure of reefer trucks. India has 15,000 reefer trucks. UK has 10 times more. Now, for ratio of size has to be applied, India would actually need, need minimum 1.5 million reefer trucks. That you see is basically the cold supply chain, which is really the backbone. Uh, to move up the value addition chain, you know, and to move uh, towards improving farmers' incomes, we have to push the food processing industry. Because remember, at the end of the day, the farmer is at the center of all this. The Indian market. This sector is meant to double in the next five years to nearly half a trillion dollars. Processed food exports, as you see, is about $35 billion, approximately 10% of India's ex exports. But in the world stage, it's only 2.31% which is very strange considering that we have such strong supply side dynamics. When you look at the food imports, India imports food worth about $20 billion, which is roughly about 4% of India's import. And the world stage, again, 1.30. That's very, very small. So we need to really increase both the, the import and the export, and India has to move up the value chain also in the global food trade. Towards this end, the government is allowing FDI under the 100% automatic route. And just in the last five years, nearly 3.28 billion of FDI has flowed into the country. The manufacturing overview. Purely dependent on its sheer size, India has a very varied agroclimatic conditions, but it suits a diverse range of food crops. The food processing growth is also supported by a large material base, like I showed you in the first slide as also a pan-India presence of nearly 2.9 million food processing units, 2.9 million. However, only 40,000 are in the organized sector. Uh, in India, in the manufacturing sector, there is a new emerging trend, that of organic food. Not many people are aware, but India hosts 30% of the total organic producers in the world. Globally, it ranks ninth in terms of uh, agricultural land under organic farming which accounts for about 2.59% of the global share, roughly about 1.78 million hectares, 10% of the Indian uh, agricultural land. A very strong distinction goes to the state of Sikkim, which in 2016 actually converted its entire cultivable land of 76,000 hectares under organic certification. In 2018, India exported organic food worth about 500 million, and most of the markets were into the West, the USA, the EU, Canada, Switzerland, Australia, Israel, South Korea, Vietnam, New Zealand, Japan. And what is supporting this? This is the government initiatives, the national food processing policy, and the Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampada. These are the two strong pillars. Uh, when you look at Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampada, Sampada basically stands for wealth. So it, it's an initiative to improve the farmer's wealth. 
when you look at the food policy, there is the government has actually uh, approved 297 cold chains projects, out of which 183 have been completed. They plan to achieve a minimum six-fold increase between now and 2030-2035 to increase output and employment. The other um, thing under the Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampada is the mega food parks. I will talk about that a bit later. Uh, government also has policies to double farm income by from between 2017 to 2022. Uh, double it, yes. The agricultural export policy of 2018 is meant to double agricultural exports by 2024. There are many other policies, one of the most important one being the National Food Security Mission, which is enacted to the Food Security Act. And let's look at the fiscal incentives. When you look at the GST, GST is, for my Swiss audience, it is something equivalent to a marriage toy or what we know as VAT in other countries. 73% um, of the food items are in the lowest tax slab of 0 to 5%. 25 are between the 12 and 18% which basically leaves only 2% in the highest tax lab. Uh, besides the favorable customs duties on imported equipment, there is also recently an announcement by the finance minister, Mrs. Sitaraman, in the stimulus package. There were two announcements for the food processing sector. The first one was a US dollar 1.3 billion assistance for the micro and small enterprise sector to upgrade the plant and machinery. The second, was about a nuclear reactor in the public-private partnership mode. Now you wonder what is nuclear reactor got to do with this? Most headlines said it's for cancer treatment, for treatment of other diseases. But what many people missed was the same reactors also meant to food aid for food irradiation and preservation. And as she said, to complement agricultural reforms and assist farmers. I come to my next slide, the mega food parks. Mega food parks are basically privately promoted through a uh, central government financial assistance through a special purpose vehicle of the Ministry of Food Processing and Industry. Most, like I said, they're mostly privately owned, but some states, like in the case of Assam, the Assam Industrial Development Corporation, <coughs> sorry, has taken 24% stake in it. Mega food parks use a cluster approach where they pr try to provide a state-of-the-art infrastructure within a certain defined agricultural or at horticultural zone. These 37 food parks are spread across the country in 24 states and are in different stages of implementation. And the strongest concentration, concentration is in South India, as you see, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu. Typically, a food park would supply you the complete range right from a supply chain infrastructure, including collection centers, primary processing centers, central processing centers, cold chain, and about 25 to 30 developed plots for develop entrepreneurs to just move in, sort of plug and play. Let's look at the opportunities. Very simple takeaway from this slide, besides what I've listed out here, is that besides just food processing machinery per se, the growth of this sector will re require equipment and machinery that basically supports the entire infrastructure across that value chain. It has to be that. For example, you could think of packing houses at the farm gate, cold storage and refrigerated transport facilities across the whole supply chain multimodal logistics, infrastructure port gateways, including sanitary facilities and phytosanitary facilities. Food packaging is also an important segment, but for that we need a separate webinar, which we did have one earlier today. Uh, just for numbers, in 2018, the food processing machinery was valued at 2.3 billion, of which imports formed 23%. Before I move to my next section, let me uh, just send as a take a message from this part of the presentation that if the output is to increase to half a trillion US dollars by 2526, as per the government's, government's vision, then a major push in the upgradation of equipment and technology is the need of the hour. I will take the liberty of talking a bit on the premium food segment, which is, well, a, a rider to what I just said. Let's look at the premium food segment. Of the total organized retail space, imported food constitutes about 15 to 20 percent. The imported food market is growing between 30 to 40 percent in the last five, four to five years. Major commodity are vegetables, fruits, and nuts, which constitute about 80 percent of the total food import. But there are certain other sectors which are showing a growth. 
mostly dairy based such as cheese creams chocolates and dips wine is one more and packaged food let's look at the distribution channels distribution channels are also driven to a certain extent by the demand um, and the growth drivers such as the affluence and the increase in the disposable income especially of the young demographic what my colleague tarun gupta spoke about there is rising urbanization lifestyle changes the well traveled consumer which has a change in taste but the most important is the ability to order online here before i talk about uh, yeah sorry some more out here um, as far as retail goes india has as per estimates recent estimates replaced china as the most favorable market for retail expansion there are up market premium food store chains food hall la marche nature's basket these are basically brick and mortar stores spread across pan india but they are also moving into the online presence a latest in last week actually forester report said that the indian e-commerce market will grow by about 6% to reach 35.5 billion this year and before i move on i want to point out two segments out here which is the horeca segment and the quick service restaurant horeca for hotel restaurants and catering these are not to be overlooked because it is not retail uh, per se but it is a very important segment for consumption of imported food for example barry calabau the famous swiss chocolate manufacturer was first selling chocolate raw chocolate out here today it has set up two plants one in gujarat one in pune just to cater to this segment now to move on to my last slide the online gross oh sorry the online grocery market between 2011 2014 india's grocery market grew by 0.05 billion to uh, 0.05 billion between 2014 to 2018 it grew at an astounding 110% to reach 1 billion by the same estimate it is expected that between 2018 and 2023 it will be a 10.5 billion market but these things might change because of the present covid-19 pandemic it has become a game changer online grocery stores are now reporting a five fold increase in demand from the time of the lockdown which was starting march big basket which i quoted before now services 300000 orders a day as compared to only 150000 orders in just in the month of may it grew 35% over the month of april grofers the other strong online grocery delivery platform has a daily gross merchandise value increase of 60% because of this flipkart and amazon have also stood in the presence and in the in coming future they'll be very strong contenders in the online grocery market with this i end my presentation i hope i've kept to my timing but before i sign off let me just remind you that missp as a platform is uh, not just to look at the indian market discovering opportunities like what we are talking about right now but to even make an actual entry i would encourage all participants to have a look at our website and check out the possibility for onboarding thank you very much Uh, thank you thank you mr austin for your uh, brief on the opportunities in the indian uh, food processing sector now let me move on to the next uh, uh, section of our webinar which is uh, uh, on from the legal and tax side uh, we have mr vaibhav sharma senior consultant rural and partner who will be speaking on the indian food processing sector from the legal side mr verma uh, mr sharma please uh, please join the webinar yes. come on screen am i audible Baba? Yes. I think I'm visible now. Yeah. 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 So, now uh, you're audible, but we can't see you. Okay. Uh, you go ahead. Go ahead. As I said, like during last five years, several reforms have been introduced by Prime Minister Modi-led government at all business stages for ease of doing business in India. 100% foreign investment is permitted in food processing business. Recently, contract manufacturing on principal to principal basis and principal to agent basis are also permitted now without any government approval. For ease of FDI-related reporting, different categories of nine forms are now subsumed in a single master form, which can be filed on a dedicated uh, 24 by 7 online portal. 
an investment coming from neighboring country of India, which shares land border now, uh, is uh, requiring the permission of government because government is sensitive about any opportunist takeover uh, caused due to COVID-19 pandemic. Now, in order to accelerate participation of food processing sector in the total FDI inflow, government has taken several measures. The government has established an apex body called Food Safety and Standards Authority of India in 2006 and consolidated more than 14 laws under one unified law. Government has also taken several initiatives to bring existing food safety and standard regulations at par with global standards, which includes alignment of Indian food regulations at par with codex standards, uh, improvised packaging and labeling requirements, and compulsory license for e-commerce entities to involve in the food business. Further, uh, the import clearance process and electronic process clearance system has also been established at six major ports in India, which has tremendously reduced the time for clearance of consignments from 12 to 8 days. Uh, similarly, to minimize the compliance uh, bottlenecks and speed the business approvals, government is emphasizing on and encouraging self-compliance culture. Single window clearance desk has also been uh, uh, set up at a state level for clearance of all approvals required for construction of factories. Similarly, state governments are also requested to consider the exemption on stamp duties for purchase of land, uh, of lease, mortgage, and hypothecation transactions. So in recent years, it has been noticed that FSSA has adopted a collaborative approach and acting as a facilitator rather than a regulator, which has tremendously helped the foreign entities to uh, comply with all the complex legal structure in the food processing sector. Then uh, a foreign entity may opt for setting up a private limited company or a limited liability partnership to carry out food processing business in India. To speed up and hassle-free setting up of a company, government has launched a single form for incorporation. Along with the single form, uh, now the stakeholders can also apply for permanent account number and tax account number as required under tax regime. Similarly, they can also apply for uh, require for the registration under uh, provident fund and state insurance schemes as required under the labeled regime. The time required for incorporation of company is now three to four days. So further, no requirement for minimum paid up capital is required. Similarly, zero incorporation fee for companies with authorized capital around Swiss franc 19,200. And as such, there is no restriction for foreign nationals to be directors in Indian companies. The government has also decriminalized several sections to save the promoters and have also omitted altogether seven offenses which were process, procedural or technical in nature and lack the elements of fraud. Further, uh, to ease out the exit mechanism, the government has also come up with a fast track winding up process whereby the small companies can be liquidated without going through the cumbersome legal procedure as already prescribed. Uh, then there has also been noticeable shift is seen in government priorities from startups to MSMEs in last four years. Government has prescribed one definition for both manufacturing and service MSMEs as displayed on the screen. Uh, the reason behind uh, uh, the consolidation of this definition was to bring more enterprises to be benefited out of COVID-19 relief packages. The turnover limit for tax audit has also been now enhanced. Now the companies uh, having turnover of 639,000 Swiss francs are required to maintain the tax audit, which was earlier 128,000 Swiss francs. Similarly, MSE facilitation councils are also established at a state level to assist these MSMEs in recovering their outstanding dues from their buyers. Then there are several reforms have been taken in the labor regime also. Uh, in India, labor regulations in India are among the most restrictive and complex in the world. With 40 plus laws at central level and 200 plus laws at state level, it becomes extremely challenging for companies, especially manufacturing concerns, to remain fully compliant. with. To bring ease in compliance, government has taken several reforms. Government has brought eight central laws, uh, statutory registers to be maintained under eight central laws uh, together. Then to bring more transparency, a unified that portal has also been developed for ease of reporting, uh, where single uh, platform has been given for reporting under laws related to wages, contract labor, industrial disputes, social security legislations. Further, MSMEs are also allowed to comply with six different major laws through a combined single certified form during the initial three years of establishment. Out of the major, um, one of the major moves taken by the government is codification of 44 plus central laws into four codes. These codes are basically pertains to wages, industrial relations, social security, and health and working conditions. Uh, further to 
protect the in, uh, manufacturing concerns to revive them from the crisis which they are facing due to COVID-19. Government has taken very swift actions at state and both central level. Uh, there are uh, several states have come up with the waiver of applicability of certain labor laws for next three years. Uh, there are several states which are also providing exemption from maintaining registers under the statutes. Then there are uh, several states have come up with enhancement of uh, their working hours time limit from eight hours to 12 hours per day. So these are the major changes which we have seen in the uh, recent uh, government policies. The tremendous efforts put by the government in last five years have not only improved India's ease of doing business policy, business ranking, but has also reduced number of days in uh, in setting up a business in India that is from 28, which was in 2015, to 18 days in 2009, which is a very big achievement. This is all from legal side. Now I would request my colleague Priyanka to take the presentation further. Thank you. Now let me formally invite uh, Ms. Priyanka Limaye, Senior Associate Auditor and Partner, to please make a presentation uh, from the uh, tax side. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sharma. And hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Priyanka, and I'll be taking you through some of the, the tax updates and also provide you a, a general uh, overview of the tax regime in India, the tax legislation. Now, before we move on to my slides, uh, why tax? The reason taxes are given so much importance, uh, you know, after the initial setting up and the legal aspects are taken over are, um, is because it, it represents a direct outflow uh, and also impacts liquidity and has a, a major impact on the bearing of the uh, cash repatriation strategies that a foreign investor would, you know, have to take. Uh, to, to take you through the tax legislation framework in India, uh, as you all are aware, it's uh, divided into two, uh, basically direct taxes and indirect taxes. With, within the realm of direct tax, we have the domestic law, that is the National Indian Income Tax Law. Uh, the, we have the treaty re, uh, regime, that is the treaty, treaty network, which is basically the double taxation avoidance agreements that India has with several uh, countries, including with uh, Switzerland. Uh, these are particularly important because, uh, uh, you know, the uh, outflow from uh, the Indian subsidiary to the foreign parent in terms of uh, royalties or service uh, payments or interest dividends are all going to be governed by the tax treaty uh, and the rates usually are, you know, sometimes at par or, you know, even favorable than the domestic law. So this is important. Uh, we also have the transfer pricing regulation, which is basically, uh, you know, uh, seeks to govern transactions between two associated enterprises or related entities. So, for for instance, Swiss uh, a Swiss parent dealing with it with uh, its Indian um, uh, and uh, subsidiary in India would have to take care of these regulations in India. And the recently, in, not the recently introduced actually, but a revamped uh, equalization levy uh, that is there in place from 1st of April 2020, which uh, you know I'll touch upon in more detail in the subsequent slide. Now, within the realm of indirect tax, we have the uh, the customs regulation and the foreign trade policy, which uh, which deals with imports and exports from India into India and also the goods and services tax, which uh, everyone is aware of uh, as, you know, the GST. Um, moving on, I'll take you through some of the general updates as far as the tax is concerned in India. The biggest change that was brought about in the year of 2019 was, uh, you know, when the finance minister announced the uh, slashing of rates of uh, corporate tax from, uh, you know, the existing 25, 30% to 22%. And this was done across for all companies without any turnover limits, which earlier uh, uh, applied to, you know, uh, there was a, turn a turnover criteria for a reduced rate that was to be taken. Of course, this reduced rate is subject to certain conditions, but we see a lot of entities getting covered in the, into the uh, new rates of tax, the 22% slab rate. The second major change that was brought about was the 15% ta tax rate, which was introduced for a manufacturing company, which was set up and operating uh, after the uh, after the date of 1st of October 2019. Uh, this was, again, a, a very surprise and a welcome change. And now this puts up India um, uh, you know, into uh, 
the uh, APAC countries most competitive tax rates uh, regime. So basically, my research so shows that uh, the global tax average, uh, as far as uh, you know, the world economy is concerned, is 23 percent, but the Asian average is 21. So we are, uh, you know, quite there. In fact, it's it's quite a globally competitive tax rate. Uh, Mr. Gupta already showed you the comparison between different countries, and this is a point that we should be, you know, proud about. You know, uh, as far as the change that is concerned. Uh, the other change that was uh, welcome and brought about in the budget of 2020 was the uh, dividend distribution tax uh, abolishing. Uh, based the earlier regime, uh, you know, the Indian companies had to pay uh, dividend distribution tax, whereas uh, now under the new regime, this tax uh, dividends are going to be uh, taxable in the hands of the, the uh, parent company or the investor company. This helps parent companies or investor companies from two fronts. Firstly, uh, they can um, uh, they are li eligible to uh, access the treaty rates. And secondly, uh, the taxes paid in India will be eligible for a credit, which was not available earlier. The other uh, change that was brought about was uh, in the equalization levy regime, which we spoke about. Basically, uh, uh, the scope of the equalization levy was expanded to include e-commerce transactions, which basically included online sale of goods and uh, provision of services. Now, this is a really big change in terms of, you know, the digital tax uh, regime in India is concerned and is bound to have an impact for a lot of non-residents uh, and foreign companies who are doing business in India, especially in the COVID times. Uh, I have been informed that I have no time left, so uh, I'll be taking you quickly through the next uh, few updates. Uh, you know, which are actually not recent updates, but, uh, uh, you know, th those are more like uh, to keep up with the global uh, and the changes proposed by the Organization for Economic Commerce and Development, this is the OECD. We have brought about a lot of changes in our uh, anti-avoidance measures. The next in this, uh, I have highlighted or outlined some of the fiscal incentives which are specific to the food processing sector. Uh, this slide is pretty self-explanatory and I wouldn't want to like spend time on this. This uh, presentation is anyways available to you uh, offline, so maybe you can refer to it later. With this, I would like to end my presentation. Uh, thank you for a patient hearing and if you have any questions, please feel, feel free to address them. Thank you so much. Dr. Singh? Thank you, Pega, for that uh, presentation. <laughs> Uh, let me now move You left on me to... with no option, so. <laughs> you know, we are out of time. We are short of time. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, no problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, yeah. uh, you know, we'll go, we'll come back to you during Q&A session if the audience asks certain questions. Uh, let me now move on to the guest speakers of today who represent uh, the Agriculture and Processed Food Products Export Development Authority of India. So let me invite uh, Mr. UK Watts, who is the general manager of uh, APEDA, the acronym uh, APEDA India for making his presentation. Uh, Mr. Watts. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to all of the members uh, here of MICCP, MISSP. I'm very glad to listen the objective and uh, 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 the view of this uh, this forum. Actually, uh, we, we uh, yes, we, the uh, environment is enabled by the government for investment as well as for uh, you know, uh, pushing up a certain sector, including uh, food processing. Food processing is a very important sector for India. Before I go further, I uh, first again introduce, I am from uh, Agricultural and Processed Food Export Development Authority. We have around uh, six sectors to look after for export promotion. These are uh, uh, starting from floriculture and seeds, fruit and vegetable, processed food, uh, fruit and vegetable, other processed food, which includes groundnut, guar gum, jaggery, confectionery, etc. Then livestock product, which is meat, meat and meat products. And uh, uh, the last one is cereals. So uh, we are not dealing with tea, coffee and promotion of these products. So uh, now coming back to the uh, uh, this topic, you know, uh, we are uh, in all the government uh, sector, including Ministry of Agriculture, Commerce, external affairs, the embassies, and uh, uh, the uh, agriculture. There are three sectors in agriculture ministry which are coordinating with us. And we are trying very hard to push the export, first of all, to get balance in this COVID period that our export uh, just went to zero because all the flights, all the uh, uh, sea, uh, sea uh, freight went into zero. 
so we we now recovered up to 30 percent and uh, uh, actually we took many steps including coordination better coordination with civil aviation agriculture commerce and we are part of commerce so commerce is a single body and uh, external affairs uh, there were several several hiccups and we observed that during this covid time we could come out with uh, many solutions and these solutions are going to exist uh, for long now so uh, starting with uh, what we done in the last few year, few uh, one year actually we coined the uh, term called agri export policy agri export policy was coined for the first time in the history of uh, food processing so uh, in agri export policy whatever the earlier speakers told that uh, we have a cluster approach in so uh, later on government came up with one district one cl cluster now situation is that that now we want infrastructure which is talked about now in the seminar to come at the farm gate otherwise the consolidation and going to mandi then picking up the goods especially fruit and vegetable was very difficult and the multimodal transportation worked out cannot work without when we we reach the production side so the need of the hour is to have the uh, infrastructure near the site production site then moving on the infrastructure infrastructure for transportation infrastructure at port infrastructure at uh, uh, these these three combining three supply chain is the our need of the hour uh, at this moment beyond that you know we have selected few products like we want to have emphasis on potato based product which we have a strength of production we want to have uh, strength uh, built up on processed mango because mango uh, in production it lasts only for uh, two three months so mango processing sector is another sector we have chosen and then we have chosen the ready to eat product which actually is a india based product indian based cuisine product you must have heard of uh, big names like haldiram mtr bikaner wala etc etc there are itc so the, these are uh, you know we are combining and preparing a strategy to popularize indian based ready to eat and ready to cook product i think all over the world the need is arising out of the uh, to use the ready to eat and ready to eat because of uh, ready to cook because uh, of shortage of time and the young entrepreneur young, young people who are busy in their profession to use the ready to eat then last last one we have also chosen the nutra health nutri critical nutri health product like millet based product and organic product my colleague saswati bose will speak little bit on uh, organic product i will put my word on rest because uh, i shortage of time our, our topic is so large that we can have another session at any time thank you very much thank you have a longer uh, you know export import uh, or trade trade you know investment related meet and then we'll have longer sessions uh, so now let me uh, thank you for your uh, for your brief remarks let me uh, now invite uh, dr saswati bose the uh, deputy general manager of agriculture and processed food products export development authority to please make a brief remarks thank you dr bose you can uh, you can come on the screen uh good afternoon thank you to sing um it is our proud privilege to be a part of this uh, program and we would like to thank the embassy of india in switzerland for inviting us to be a part of uh, this webinar and share our perspectives um as the name indicates that we are agriculture and processed food products export development authority to our, we are mainly into the promotion of agricultural exports from the country so um regarding the opportunities in the food processing sector my senior colleague has already given a detail about the investment perspective also and the products we are looking into because food processing is a sunrise industry in our country and there is lot of uh, prospects in there 
but uh, while we look into the investment part of it i would like to also uh, put emphasis on the fact that india is also a very prominent supplier of agri products to the world so we export um, after agri exports uh, of india about 40 to 50% is covered by india uh, so we are uh, we are exporting to all the countries uh, and even to europe uh, we are uh, exporting but the to switzerland uh, as per our statistics it is only 1% of the total exports that we are doing to europe so we have a lot of scope to increase our exports to switzerland and uh, switzerland does import a lot of processed products from india which includes uh, guar gaum milk products and uh, uh, gherkins processed vegetables apart from cereals rice etc regarding organic products potential uh, one of our earlier speakers spoke about organic products organic products is a very important and prominent sectors and yes we do have a very prominent presence and in this regard i would like to uh, mention that uh, india has its national standards that is the national program for organic production npop which uh, and uh, which is a official and mandatory standards for export of organic products from the country and we have a equivalence uh, with the european union regulation for the unprocessed products that is category a and f and even with the switzerland so uh, products certified under npop are unprocessed products are exported under the npop certification to europe and uh, our uh, share in the in terms of value of organic exports to usa is 55% to europe is uh, 31% but to switzerland switzerland ranks fourth but still the share is 1% so again we have a lot of scope to increase our exports to uh, switzerland and uh, we had last year we had uh, exported about 6000 metric tons of value of 9.88 uh, million us dollar and the major products are cereals oil seeds processed foods spices etc now uh, for exports to you we do maintain all the international requirements as i already said that we uh, we have equivalency arrangement apart from that for fresh products also we uh, we follow the eu requirements and export takes place of fresh fruits and vegetables through our apida recognized pack houses so we have a traceability system in place our organic product has a full traceability up to the farm level which we have a web based traceability system tracenet and we have traceability system for grapes which is also a very important product which is exported by india to the european countries and we have uh, other for other Uh, vegetables and fruits also we have a hoti net system so uh, we uh, we have been involved we are involved in promotion of exports through our embassies we participate in the international events and uh, we do take the delegations and do product promotion programs and international buyer seller meets also we do reverse buyer seller when the importers can visit in to our facilities and see for our, uh, themselves uh, the type of the export uh, facilities that we have the requirements that we meet now under the present situation also we are trying to keep on the linkages uh, with the importers and the exporters and we are organizing the virtual buyer seller meet so we do uh, wish to uh, one would like to organize a virtual buyer seller meet for the importers of switzerland and the export indian exporters so i would request all the importers uh, to give in your requirement of the products that is the processed organic fresh whatever you are looking into importing from india to our embassy so that we can accordingly uh, you know identify and arrange for interaction with some of the prominent exporters and before i conclude i would like to uh, just add on to the investment opportunities in india there is a lot of immense uh, potential for investments i will not go into the technical details of it but yes my earlier speakers mentioned that we there is a need for lot of infrastructure in the agriculture sector especially the food processing sector the value addition sector then the logistic logistics the including farm gate logistics so uh, while we need a lot of investments uh, for this infrastructure we would also uh, like to add on that it will be mutually beneficial because these investments will also provide the swiss impo- uh, investors an access to the indian market indian domestic market is quite a large market we are the third largest purchasing power in the world so you get a, uh, access to the indian markets then when you like you are importing processed product from our country so you can process in our country and then you can import to your, uh, switzerland or maybe you can export from here to the asian countries or uh, to the middle east countries so we can become a export hub also uh, for the agri products so i think that we can look into uh, somewhere in a, uh, for increasing our agri trade which will be mutually beneficial for both the country thank you very much
thank you dr bose that was a very thank you dr bose that was a very very informative uh, you know briefing you've done uh, on, on the trade and the investment side i thank you very much now that brings me to the question and answer session which i will keep short because of uh, you know because we have will breach otherwise the time limit so uh, i'll go by the speaker order in terms of asking questions uh, a question that has been uh, posed uh, uh, to mr tarun gupta is uh, has digitization helped reduce the entry barrier for foreign food brands mr gupta uh, thank you dr singh and my thanks to the audience for asking this question uh, one of the challenges always for a foreign brand has been how to reach out to a massive country like india and what it has done is over the last as uh, my colleague mr merchant mentioned because of the growth in the grocery segment today the online grocery share is only 1% of the total grocery and grocery spend is 60% of the total retail spend so what it does is now the large players who are in this they reach 97% of the pin codes in india so as a result including all the top 8 cities so what it does is for a foreign brand if they come into india they are able to jump over the challenge of reaching that distribution that is the single biggest advantage of digitization plus of course once you have more people able to do online transactions you get more customers under your belt mm -hmm. thank you uh, thank you uh, thank you mr gupta uh, the next question i'll pose to mr uh, ashwin merchant uh, we've got questions on um, uh, fdi uh, in for buying agricultural land in india by by private companies so if you could uh, thank you dr singh for this question uh, mr ashwin merchant fdi under the food processing in the food processing sector is allowed per se 100% without uh, through the automatic route as far as it comes to land it's a different question it also uh, is something which i cannot really on answer but i'll ask my colleague tarun gupta to take this if you don't mind dr singh yes please Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tarun ji, if you could answer this question. Break agriculture vis-a-vis -vis processing. Processing 100% FDI, no problem. You buy a land, set up a factory, that's not a problem. But when it comes to agricultural land, yes, that is a restriction. So hence, what foreign companies have done, they have engaged in contract farm. Now that is a big thing wherein we have seen large firms. engaging in contract farming uh, both in terms of meeting their own captive requirement but also using the agri produce for uh, their captive consumption and thereafter for export purposes so my answer food processing yes for agri land no thank you thank you uh, mr gupta let me move to the next question which is for apparently mr vabav saxena it's a question of fs sai licensing and how does it apply to contract food processing and which licenses are mandatory we can't hear you uh, so typically the definition of uh, manufacturer as prescribed in the regulations includes contract manufacturers also so my answer to the question would be yes it would require the licenses from the fssai now the typically there are two kinds of licenses required basically two licenses can be taken by a company one is at central level and another is at state level it depends upon the turnover so uh, if an entity has a turnover which is frank uh, 2500 58777 around approximately then it would require a state license however the license uh, would, be, would be for the uh, business de dealings to be happened in state only uh, and if the turnover is beyond that figure then a central uh, license would be required over to you mr singh okay thank you thank you uh, thank you thank you babu uh, there is another question which i'll uh, pose to um, uh, our representative from apeda Uh, says that guar gum exports are one of the prominent agri commodity could they be guided on the investment and processing plants relating to guar gum uh, guar gum exports yeah uh, exactly the uh, uh, unit uh, 
unit uh, investment is not known uh, to me at the pre at the moment but i'll reply to that later on but uh, guardam in in three forms it is going it is pulverized it is seed it is uh, as a powder also so th there are if a unit have three type of investment they want they will uh, they, they can do it and the pr probable area would be the rajasthan belt rajasthan belt where it's a dry area lot of gorgam is produced in that area so i can tell about that but uh, the investment requirement i right now i can't tell okay uh, so mr we can later on share the details uh, yes, you know, yes, we can yes. get the okay. details from you sir there's one more okay. question which i think uh, you might be able to answer uh, which is uh, uh, due to topography of land india covers uh, from very dry to very cold weather possibilities is india pushing olive production in india if yes where uh yes uh, yeah, uh, of course uh, olive is becoming very popular in india but uh, since it has not been export has not been started so uh, i really don't uh, again this uh, information i'll get you later but uh, one thing is sure that uh, not much production is, uh, is there in, in sure. olive yeah sure thank you uh, thank you mr watts and uh, you know the questions uh, where we need more details we'll uh, write back to all the participants today so uh, with that we come to the conclusion of the uh, webinar all the presentations that we have made today would be on our mhsp website we'll also be releasing uh, this uh, webinar as a podcast which would be uploaded also on our website uh, i hope that we have been able to reinforce the idea that lots of complementarities exist between indian and swiss business ecosystems and there are immense possibilities and uh, with those words i thank all of you the presenters as well as the audience who have joined us today uh, and i look forward to also having a number of swiss companies who have joined today become msp members thank you have a good day